Hey! Okay, Come we're so live. Let's... We're live. A new... Go back. With Thanks, my Bill. Yeah, and you'll want to record as well. So hit record to cloud. Yeah. Uh, how do I do that? Just at the bottom next to share screen. I'll record, yeah. Record to the cloud, yeah. Okay, thanks we'll so much. Back up. Yeah, no problem, bye. Thank you. Bye. Hi, Ariane. Hi, hi, hi. <laughs> I'm in the middle of getting ready. It looks like this is it. <laughs> <laughs> well, best is to be like that or not there at all. Yeah, I've yeah. got two minutes. Just, <clears throat> hi, Tom, meet Ariane. Ariane, meet Tom. Hi, Ariane. <laughs> hi, Tom. I think we met, met years and yes, years ago. Yes, we did. We, we spoke. How are you? In CERN. You even came to CERN, I think. Yes, yes. <clears throat> Yeah. Marcus. Yes, we did. And there's Marcus. <clears throat> Is Marcus there? Uh, no. Marcus. Which Marcus? Marcus. <laughs> so which Marcus? How many Marcuses <laughs> do we have today? <laughs> I thought it was Marcus Frias that's joining us this morning. Yeah. Don't know if you. So, so how is everyone? Are you all well? As well it's as my morning. How are it's you? my morning. I'm well. We're in uh, we're in COVID zero situation here, which is incredible. Where are you? Where are you? I'm in Melbourne, Australia. Okay. And you are in London. Yes. <laughs> Tier three, <laughs> whatever that Congra means. Congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome, Jonathan. Hi there. How are you? Somebody just said the dreaded words tier three. Hi, Jonathan. Hey, Ariane. <laughs> Hi, Ariane. How are you? <laughs> are you good. in London? Are you in the UK? Yes, I'm in tier three in London. <laughs> oh, lucky you. Lucky you. Where are you? Where are you then? I'm at Somerset House. You are really? Yeah, sunny. It's sunny. <laughs> it's late night at Somerset House. Jonathan, meet Tom Kovac. He's sitting next to you. Hi, Tom. Hi. Nice How to are you? you. So you've also got Theo Spiriopoulos at Somerset House, I believe. We have, yeah. yeah. Yes. Lovely. Yeah, he's cool. Very cool guy. Yes. Good evening, Joao. <clears throat> haven't been hanging out with him too much recently. Yeah, <laughs> we've been hanging out on Zoom a little bit, but that's, that's about as much as we've been hanging out. Yeah. <clears throat> where are you where are you are you in uh... <clears throat> well i'm supposed to be i'm supposed to be in london where i live half of the year but we essentially i'm in melbourne because of COVID. there's hardly any travel yeah, yeah. but no, as it turns no. out it's possible really it's very strict right now yes it is <clears throat> mm. well meet jonathan tom and ariane I, You're, uh, are you in London or Portugal? Portugal. Ah. Oh. <laughs> Hi. How are you? Good to see you. I'm good. <laughs> Clawing my way to the end. <laughs> <laughs> this is the official end for me. Hi, Marcus. Hey, Lucy. How are you doing? Good. How are you? Good. Yeah. Thanks late, for having yeah. us over at your house so late. I'm in the kitchen. <laughs> How are you, Hanan? I'm great, thank you. Good. Hello, Hanan. How are you? Hello, Tom. Hey, Tom. Hey, hey, Marcus. How are you? I can only see four people. You got to extend your, your view, your portal. <laughs> yeah, extend my view, please. Make me I don't. I don't have the preferences to do that. I'm afraid. <clears throat> Hi, Pamela. <clears throat> so we are just waiting for a couple more people. Uh, Hi, Natu. Hi. Twice in one week. Lucky me. <laughs> I can see the same. <laughs> <laughs> 
And hopefully this is Esther. So um, for those of you who are familiar with these kinds of um, student reviews, um, or maybe I should say for those of you, hi, Clive. What's hi. up? Hey, how are you doing? Good. Super good to see you. Thank I was you. Just, I was just um, leaping into the inf informalities of how this studio is and that, you know, the state of how we all feel right now, whether it's 10 p.m., 9 a.m., 2 p.m. or 5 a.m. Hi, Dad. <laughs> he said he might join as an interloper from Australia. Um, it's really informal. Say whatever you feel. Um, the more kind of uh, shy and embarrassed comments, I'm more interested in those. Um, Esther, nice to meet you. Thanks for coming. Thanks for having me. Uh, Sorry, I'm a little... No, no problem. Late. No problem at all. So um, we'll get started. The studio is called uh, Mutineers Manifesto. Um, and... Good title. Embarrassed comments. I'm more interested in Ooh. those. Um, Esther, nice to meet you. Sorry. Um, all right. So um, thank you all for coming. I know that uh, some of you are in London. We'll have to leave, uh, you know, earlier than... <laughs> the three hours that we will be here, but I'm really grateful that you're all here. Um, I'll just make uh, some really short introductions. It's very hard to introduce you all because you have very extensive backgrounds, but I've, um, I've had my own kind of hack. So hopefully uh, <laughs> it makes sense. So Hanan Diaz Alonso um, is the SIARC CEO and director of the school. He's the director of HDAX and I'm, um, I'm so thrilled that you can join us. I know it's um, a mental week. Um, Ariane Cook, um, an independent international arts, science, technology consultant, director, producer, writer, um, and specializes in residency programs, um, known for initiating and designing uh, the three strands of arts at CERN. Um, including the Collide Residency Program um, at Geneva. And Ariane was one of the curators for an exhibition that I'm part of this year called Real Feelings in Switzerland. So Joao, Joao Medeiros is a contributing editor for Wired Magazine, editing and writing stories at the internet intersection of science, technology and medicine. He's interviewed personalities like Stephen Hawking, Stella McCartney, Greta Thunberg. Um, he creates, curates the Wired Health Tech event, which is where we met some years back, and is the author of Game Changers, How a Team of Underdogs and Scientists Discovered What It Takes to Win. Natu Fall is a design faculty at SIARC and recent graduate. Uh, her thesis project, Shaping Face, was awarded the Gary Prize for the best graduate thesis project from the class in 2019. Um, Natu currently runs an eponymous epin, epin, multidisciplinary practice, working as an art director, makeup artist, graphic designer, and architectural designer. Clive Van Heerden is, uh, has a background in social sciences um, and a master's degree in design from the Royal College of Art. He is the founder and director of VHM, Design Futures in London, which is a strategic design consultancy specialising in lifestyle and technology future scenarios. Uh, Clive is best known for leading the design probe program at Philips, which is um, where we met. Um, he initiated and incubated new product categories within Philips, such as electronic tattoos, dresses that blushed and shivered with light. Um, which resulted in joint ventures and new product startups. And he maintained strong academic relationships in three continents. Esther Choi is an artist, architectural historian, and theorist moving between art and architecture. 
She examines the overlaps between art, architecture and the life sciences to probe interrelated concepts of nature and human nature. Uh, Esther is the co-editor of Architecture at the Edge of Everything Else and her artist book Le Corbuffet was nominated for a James Beard Award for Photography this year. Jonathan Rieke, Jonathan Rieke spent the first 25 years of his career um, working mainly in performing arts, opera, music, and, and then it goes blank. <laughs> Sorry, Jonathan. Theatre? Could it? Or performing arts? Um, in 2014, he became director of Somerset House, establishing it as London's working art centre within an with an interdisciplinary cultural program that aims at relevance and tackling the critical issues of our time. He's built Somerset House into the biggest creative community in the UK, including Somerset House Studios and Makerverse. Marcus Fares, oh, Marcus Fares is founder and editor in chief of Design. He was the first digital journalist to be awarded an honorary fellowship of the Royal Institute of British Architects. Marcus wrote the book 20th Century of Design. And we first met back in 2014, where Marcus commissioned my first installation work um, in London called the Astronaut Aerobics Institute. John Cooper, who will join us later, is SIAP faculty in history and theory. John's projects include haircuts at the Bauhaus and the lecture apparatus of Sir John Soane. Um, and he's seen here as the, the showman for SIARC's 2020 spring show. And finally, Tom Kovac is an architect. I've added this curator and critic focused on cutting edge technological experimentation. Tom is the curator of the Italian Pavilion at Venice Biennale 2021. Tom is known to provoke, disrupt and build new methods for architecture, future cities and ways of being, be it digital and physical. And Tom is how I was first introduced to SIARC. So uh, I wanted to also thank my extraordinary uh, assistant and co-pilot, Christian Pepper, um, and, and also a couple of other students who will be joining us later. So um, just a quick uh, sort of fly over Mutineers Manifesto. Um, I really like this quote from Yuval Noah Harari, which is a take on um, Max Planck's uh, sort of theory on that it's only when one generation passes that are we able to kind of uproot theories that have been held there for such a long time. And I think that this year is, is an example that that is no longer the case. Um, we, we live now in a population where Generation Z are the largest population, I think they make up 32%. These are ages eight to 23. And so Mutineers Manifesto is really looking at how this population would um, tackle and um, speculate on the future. And so um, the studio gives students the opportunity, the time, the place to explore alternative speculative realms um, and it is, it is much about examining emerging technologies as it is to intentionally neglect known tro tropes, um, mostly science fiction, and to kind of utilise and subvert these tropes. So each student has never made a film before. They've, they've not edited, they've not screen written, art directed, some screen as the protagonist in their project. Um, and, and first and foremost, the props that have been made became the investigation of the work. Um, the objects were made blindly. No one knew what they were going to turn into, um, but they became the premise and the story for the project. So the story came after what is made, which is not um, normal in my experience. So the limitations of working from home became part of the investigation. So. Um, whether you're baking uh, in your kitchen, foraging in the apartment next door, shooting in the bath, borrowing your dad's camera, using your roommate's balcony or your back, your back shed, um, 
you know, this source of re, re, this sense of resourcefulness was also what brought a new texture and aesthetic to the work. So um, let's start with the first group. Hello. Hi, um, thank you all for coming today. I'm Yoon Ki and my partner is Hans. Hello. Um, so to give you guys some context, in the mid 21st century, a small mushroom farmer can no longer afford to pay the licensing fee to grow their crops. And this is their story. Um, can you guys hear the sound?
Okay, so um, we did a little bit of research, and in 1999, the Monsanto Agrochemical Company sued a small farmer who had unknowingly purchased and planted copyrighted GMO seeds for copyright infringement. And the case reached the US Supreme Court in 2013 and was an unanimous decision in favor of Monsanto. At that time, Monsanto had already won over $27 million in patent enforcement lawsuit on GMO plants. And a few years after the Monsanto case, in 2015, the FDA cleared CRISPR CAS9 edited white button mushrooms for sale in the United States without health and nutritional regulations. Meanwhile, computer scientist Ian Goodfellow and his colleagues were developing the first generative adversarial network, or GAN, published in 2014. A GAN is a method of machine learning designed to generate result cases that at least superficially appear to be authentic. By 2017, Cornell scientists had proposed GANs as a method of creating synthetic DNA sequences, saying they believed that these neural networks could, quote, allow us to generate new sequences whose properties are estimated to be superior than those found in the training data, close quote. And, um... The, the following slides are just going to be like um, to show like our uh, like our platform, how we collaborate stuff and like what we've like done to make the products and stuff like that. Should we open it up to questions? Yeah. All right. Um, should I loop the video or just flip through the slides? Um, maybe just loop the video in the background with the sound off. Feel free to chime in whenever you feel. I, I'd like to start with something. Um, hey, everybody. I miss everybody. <laughs> <laughs> nice to see you. Uh, faces from California again. Um, I think it's very interesting that you're sort of hinting into this new world that um, isn't really like too far off, right? We're sort of hinting into this new category of living where we're isolated from everybody. But in a way, you're also sort of fighting the corporations, right? By trying to negotiate this idea that people have the power to, to combat um, corporations in, in, in many different ways. And this is something that is actually happening. Um, they've, they've been a lot of uh, people that are sort of beginning to investigate uh, GMOs to the point where they can breed and genetically modify organisms in the back of their house, right, in a garage. Um, and to me, this is one of the strongest points that you're kind of showing, Red, that you are able to like produce this anywhere. It doesn't matter if you're like out in the middle of nowhere, like in a rural area, but it's also sort of um, impacting institutions as well, where, um, for example, all of us went to architecture school, right? But we all know that half of the things we learned were not at school. They are in a database somewhere, right, in Google. And some, I would say about 40% of the stuff that we have learned in our majors is through research outside of school. Um, and so this is, in a way, it, it, it's sort of destabilizing the way that school should work, right? And then this new physical entity of not, not having to go to school and being able to learn anything online, right, is sort of the catalyst for 
to sort of push that idea further now. And so I think that you are sort of riffing on that idea that you are able to make your own research, um, create new things, right? Establish premises without the need of a diploma, without the need of, of, of money, of, of corporations. And so this is, this is something that's very interesting in your project. I think yeah, I love the aesthetic. I mean, the aesthetic is so beautifully thought through and the colour palette as well. And I wondered if you would comment on that, on how you arrived together at that kind of consensus with the aesthetic, because it's really beautiful. Hi, everybody. Tom Kovac. Um, very beautiful work. Uh, I just wanted to say... It, it, it really is interesting to see how this type of work advances a kind of number of observations regarding how scientific work is conducted, including the complex relationship between routine lab practices, which are performed by scientists and, you know, the publications of papers, you bring in scientific prestige and you think about elements of laboratory life, but it also opens up the conversation about the kind of anthropological discovery about how we begin fictionalizing or semi-fictionalizing the kind of work and, you know, the idea of the ignorant observer that starts to interrogate the questions about the practices of laboratory, but also the way design is starting to look into alternative methods of practicing and re redefining <clears throat> research and development of new strategies for design. So I think this really starts to open up a new mechanism and a new methodology for observation and making, and it opens up potentials for a, constituting a kind of a new raw way of developing design to become a systematic, systematic way of looking and inscripting new ways of qualifying. And it kind of produces a kind of immune, I would call it immune, immune, immune system to the currency of current production, but at the same time, it enables us to see the world in a kind of a new way, which kind of looks from a macro to a micro and back into the macro again to have a completely different understanding of the mechanisms that may, may produce a different world and a kind of a different observation of the world around us and how we as creatives can start to think about in transdisciplinary way of working and to think about the progressing you know, decreasing some of the things that we've been looking at, but also looking at possible alternatives to look at alt uh, ways to produce uh, a, a system for interrogation of design, architecture, and the world around us. Thank you. Uh, uh, oh, go ahead, please. Um, I'm, go ahead, Hernan, it's fine. No, no, not to, please. Okay, I guess what I wanted to comment on was um, just the sort of dichotomy that you guys have uh, created in your project where the, in this world that you've created is sort of so, technology is so advanced, yet everything in your sort of lab environment is incredibly low tech. Um, you know, down to the materials you sort of made your um, sort of like study space out of and really the only, the only technology we really start to like see is when it's used to sort of identify what's um, or these sort of gene trackers um, like in in this moment here or where we see the, the sort of mood board um, and I just sort of appreciate that that sort of low tech high tech um, and the way you've combined combined it in your project I think it's great. Thank you. Maybe in relation to what Natu just said um, my, my, mine is more about the overall of the film. Um, uh, and I think it has to do with aesthetics uh, as a weapon. Um, I think it's a gorgeous project um, because I think it has a couple of really, a couple of things that I find is super effective. It's almost like a create uh, a nostalgia of a future is about to happen, but not nostalgia in a derogative way, but nostalgia as a weapon in things and elements that we can recognize, that we feel familiar but they get distorted and reaccommodated in a different in a different logic. They completely change the perception of that. So there is something incredibly uh, close uh, and feel homey and, and domestic, but at the same time, 
there is a all underline of of uh, strangeness or perversion, uh, but the way that you frame it and the way that the the film flows, it make it as I said, it make it feel like a, almost like a kind of a science fiction nostalgia, which I, I found that, that incredibly compelling uh, uh, as a narrative and, and and incredibly effective. Like it, it make it it make it feel absolutely real and possible and present. So uh, I find that a, a, a remarkable achievement. I'm interested in the the the, the choice of music and um, um, the it, as someone who's not used to watching these kind of projects. I was kind of waiting for a protagonist. I was waiting for there to be like a visible uh, human element to the drama. I, I think it is really beautiful and thought provoking and. And I finally figured out how to move all of your faces to the left so I can read the text at the end. But um, that would be my question. Why the, what's the choice of music and how does that um, help the mood and inspire the mood that you get? And did you think to put people in it so there was a, a, a sort of double narrative of, of a human drama as well? So I guess for, first I'm gonna answer Ariane's question about the color palette um, and then I'll move on to uh, Marcus's. So the color palette was actually a little bit of a challenge um, for us uh, because I am colorblind. So a lot of the deference was to Yinky on the, on the color choice. Um, so, so a lot of that was her driving, but we just sat down in front of one computer one day and we're like, okay, we're gonna figure out the color. Um, so maybe she can expand a bit on that once I am done <laughs> rambling. Um, and then I guess we also were very averse to putting people explicitly in this. It was one of the things that we wanted some distance from. We wanted the, the technology and the discussion about what the technology was to be the protagonist. So keeping a human um, protagonist as far removed from it as possible was definitely something that we were looking for. Um, and then the music, we initially had something really ambient where there wasn't a lot of drum beat to align clips to. Um, but then as we started looking more and more, we felt that that sort of uh, percussive nature really reinforced it. Um, but we didn't want to abandon the drone that we had initially. So this song in particular was a very good middle ground between those two where it is the droning introduction and then strong beat comes in. Can I just say yeah. something? I, I, I think that just quickly to, to sort of comment on what you just said, and I think what Marcus and Hernan also alluded to was the notion that I think the, the music really frames and, and places the project in time. While you were speaking, I was thinking about how, you know, the, the emotional depth of science, science fiction is some, somehow technologicalized and sort of it focuses too much on technology, whereas this, in a way, if you take the music away, it's kind of timeless. And it, it kind of creates a situation where you have the phenomena of of the of the and focus on the mythological and a kind of a condition where the narrative is controlled by an experimental dichotomy between kind of reality but a new surfacing of new methods of production but the music starts to bed it in a kind of a time zone and i think when you speak about the <clears throat> the um the, the beats, the drum beats, etc., which kind of puts the idea of sound into the into the perspective. It gives it a, a kind of a growing uh, notion of a kind of an other way of us to explain the proposition of a condition that addresses a very interesting narrative, but it's a non-linear narrative and it's one that constantly surprises. And this takes you out of the idea of a comfort zone, of a comfort zone that you're actually looking at a narration so I think that when Marcus is speaking about the music and the protagonist, I think the protagonist never really arrives because in many ways you could think, I think of this as a, some of you might remember the movie Solaris by Tarskovsky. Uh, the first, <clears throat> I think this really reminds me of the first movies of, of Solaris where you see the country house and the river and the water and it sort of displaces you because you think there's a kind of a protagonist that's going to arrive, but it never really arrives. So the moment is really an extended 
way for you except another condition of reading or rereading the way we see things around us in a very peculiar way. So, um, yeah, very exciting to see this, but I think the idea of this, this alien that never arrives or this new way of production and technological discovery is a very interesting way of capturing a generation in, in cinematic quality. So congratulations, really love it. Yeah, yeah I, I, I completely agree. It's all like there is an implied protagonist. If this was to go on for another 10 minutes, you'd expect there to be a sort of a hero or a, a broken relationship or something. Or, alternatively, you might expect the singer's face to kind of fade in and then you've got a brilliant music promo, which also has a kind of philosophical backdrop to it. But it, it, it works really well without it. But I think I can't, for me, I can't, um, disentangled the impact, the emotional impact of the music on it is really profound. If there was a different soundtrack, I would take a different reading from it. I think. I I um I really enjoyed um what you did, and I I just wondered, um, did you deliberately choose the mushroom as an organism? Because one of the things I was thinking about as I watched the film is, a mushroom is an extraordinary organism that, in a way you could argue man will never kind of conquer. So I kind of wondered almost if the mushroom was the protagonist <laughs> um, and that actually humans wouldn't be able to, to dominate uh, and yeah, control it. But I wondered whether that was a deliberate choice or was that just a kind of pragmatic <laughs> illustration of, of what you were trying to talk about? Um, so the thoughts about mushrooms being something that exists, um, outside of human control kind of came to us as, as they emerged as the front runner of what prop to use, they kind of came together simultaneously about the time that we were halfway through with production. Um, and I started reading, uh, Anna Singh's Mushroom at the End of the World. Okay, yeah. yeah. Which talks about like how yeah. mushroom foraging is like a paracapitalist way of production. Um, and I, I th think that them as a symbol of rebirth and regrowth is also very important to the film. And this is effect, this kind of slightly sort of delayed effect. So I, yeah, I, it almost feels like it's a bandwidth issue, but it's deliberate. It's really, it's really, what is that technique? The, the way that the things sort of slightly judder and the motion is slightly blurred. That really, really is quite powerful. Almost stop motion in that footage there of the package being pushed. It's almost mm. stop motion. And it's very, it reminds me of the opening scenes of The Handmaid's Tale as well, that kind of forest chase, that kind of slightly alienating but also somehow romantic mood that that has. Yeah, and I love the way everything is frayed. So the fraying is all the way through, whether it's in the juddering motion or in the fraying of the cloth. It's, it's beautiful. It almost gets you back to the fact that actually laboratories, as Paul was indicating, think about science. Laboratories actually are always human. They always have individuals. They are almost homemade. They're not clinical. So there's something very beautiful about that, that kind of dichotomy again. I think Hi, Lucy, you. I think Lucy, can I just jump in quickly on back of this comment? I think what's really interesting about when I'm listening to comments and looking at the work is that it just reminds me a little bit about the, the new COVID vaccine that came by Pfizer, but was really discovered by a small lab, husband and wife team, Ugur Sahin and his wife, which, it's kind of, you could think about the, the, the vaccine, which is kind of providing to be 90% effective could really be produced in a kind of a lab. And if you think of, if we kind of backtrack and we kind of produce the narration cinematically of the vaccine for COVID, you could imagine that it came from a kind of a research of a garage somewhere in Germany, which came out of a forest. And it's sort of like an anthropological discovery while, you know, you're looking at a vaccine that potentially could come out of a totally totally um, t uh, kind of a uh, laboratory life. It reminds me of the book Laboratory Life by Bruno Latour and also Craig Venter's research in DNA when Craig mentioned that if you put a bucket of water across uh, out into the sea 
in the, in the actual bucket of water, you got a million different bacteria and life that's actually never visually seen. So this idea that we trust the ocular versus the sensorial, and you think about how many sensorial aspects the human being actually possesses, then you can start to think about you know, a, viral, a viral definition of the future of life produced in a very similar way. And you sort of captured this cinematically and you sort of say, well, that's a 21st century vaccine this kind of saves the planet. So this kind of narrative is kind of very interesting because it underlies this idea of the scientist Sahin and his wife working in a garage to produce this incredible solution. And it starts to discuss the idea of pharmaceutical research and the design of, of that aspect, which produces this phenomenal phenomenology of the future, which could potentially be existing in, in and makes that individual a much more potent participant in a kind of a larger pharmaceutical or global phenomena, if you like. Yeah. Thank you. I, I, um, I've been paying particular interest to the kind of spirit of biohackers. And there's a, I guess he's kind of a celebrity biohacker, Josiah Zayner, who's distributing CRISPR um, technology from his garage. And, and one of the things he says is that the world will be changed by someone who we don't know yet working from their garage because it's so accessible. So I think part of this studio was also to liberate <laughs> The students to to be thinking about science as a as a kind of citizen science, and also um, you know just thinking about. Um, I, I mentioned this yesterday, Hanan, in, in your um, review that science has the power to design, but science hasn't come from an education of design, and so that's why science and art and design coming together can be so powerful um, because of the the way that science is unfolding. I like the unconquerable mushroom. <laughs> I think yeah. some of these comments about um, the coloration, the tonality of it, the, the music, uh, for me, they're all really important in trying to decipher if what your position is on this kind of proprietary nature of nature with capital N nature. Um, and I, I don't totally know that from watching this and I had put in the chat, like I was wondering if I could maybe take a look at your PDF that you had presented just to see some of your references uh, a little more closely. But, um, you know, Anna Singh, I think is, is the right is the right person to sort of like start referencing in terms of thinking about the kind of commodification of nature, what Jason Moore calls cheap nature um, uh, in the web of life. But, you know, to maybe to glean a little bit more of a position on that, because I feel like there's a kind of the music makes it makes it seem a little ambivalent. You know, it seems like it's actually quite, quite pleasant in some ways, but yet uh, the coloration has a kind of like estrangement, you know, the kind of cool cyan tones has a feeling of estrangement. So I'm, I'm not sure that I totally can sense how you as the people that authored this, like how, where you where you position yourself in relation to to this trajectory of of a kind of proprietorship around, you know, the web of life. I would yeah, say we're. I, mean, I wanted to echo some of some of what was said. This is Clive, incidentally. Um, you know, th this tension between the sort of formal regulatory world and people that have pioneered uh, scientific breakthroughs. Um, in opposition to that, you know, despite the constraints and the restraint of, of officialdom. If you look at what Seymour Papert was saying in the 1980s about, about, you know, kids at school understanding that education no longer provided for their needs, that the genie was out, that, that they were not under any sort of illusion that curricular education was something that was going to equip them for the world that, that, um, that they were going into. It, it's taken at an, an entire generation for that to become the reality of Gen Z, where people are graduating from school and they have nowhere to go and are, are very, very much understanding that, um, that reality now. But coming back to the mushrooms, I thought that was a really appropriate thing. You know, we're surrounded by 20,000 microfungi and what Lucy was saying about biohackers pushing against the regulation. If you, you know, if you think about helminthic medicine where people are using parasites, mushrooms being one of those in, you know, in developing treatments for multiple sclerosis and completely breaking the law at every single stage of that process. Um, you know, the already, as has already been mentioned, the sort of, you know, some of the sort of alternate avenues that have been explored in, 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 in dealing with this, this uh, 
virus crisis um, at present. I thought, you know, and so I wasn't sure whether I was reading a kind of a covert, um, subversive sort of um, strain in, in, in the movie, but, you know, I thought it was really beautiful and very, very appropriate for, for the time. Um, so to answer about like the coloration, like we started like a mood board in the beginning of the semester and like we collected images and stuff that we really like. So um, I guess it started from there and then, um, and then we tried to like um, kind of match it in a way to make it more like, because like our like technology is supposed to be very homemade and and like very accessible. So we're thinking about something like the, the color grading to be a little bit more cozy. So it's like, there's some sort of like vignette around this like um, kind of focusing um, on that particular framing and stuff like that. So um, yeah, to show. I mean, it seemed quite apocalyptic in some ways because I think, you know, the classic Kind of cinematic technique is that fluorescent lighting where everything gets green you know a little green tinge so you have the reference to a laboratory but then sort of like the fraying that ariane was referring to you know it has this idea of like the humble the survival aesthetic you know kind of back to so i think that like dichotomy is super interesting and i think it works but i i wonder if like you know i mean part of what anna singh talks a lot about is the economy around around fungi, right? So, mm -hmm. um, you know, like I was thinking about how the Honeycrisp apple has generated $6 million for the University of Minnesota because they hold the patent to the Honeycrisp apple, right? Because they, they developed it in their laboratory. And if there's a way in which in some ways, it could even just be the kind of like the, the kind of faux data viz that you overlay, you know, with your kind of like faux metrics that, you know, you have in earlier on, but maybe if there's a way in which somehow that layer of the project could you know, in terms of IP, in terms of like how that is really generated, it's a way of generating capital that maybe somehow some of that could be a way to, at least for me as a viewer, sort of understand sort of what that maybe, maybe render even more clearly what some of those tensions are and some of those kinds of layers of kind of, um, kind of economic layers and, you know, and how they overlap with the environmental and how they overlap with the biopolitical and, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So, you, you know, if that makes sense. I, I don't know if like, I'm, I don't know if I'm really getting a position from you, you know, like how you feel about this. It seems quite like, it's, it's quite ambivalent in some ways. Which is not to say it's not beautiful. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but I think, I think, you know, I want to know sort of like, is there a danger to the scenario? Or are you just like, are you okay with it? Like, I just don't really know where you're, how you feel as authors. Sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I must say, I also, I think the aesthetic of the, the costumes and the kitchen is like cardboard and string and muslin. It's like a, it's like a, I don't know, like homemade cheese factory or so it's, it's, or um, what's the name? Faye Too Good. I mean, the aesthetic is really sort of um, folksy and almost jarring with the scientific intelligence of, of the concept, but which, but it kind of really works. It's really, I don't find it dystopian at all. I find it really warm and romantic and, and um, yeah, optimistic somehow. I really like the, the, the way that the, 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 the physical objects that you've designed sort of kind of subvert the whole science fuck of the concept. Um, I guess as the, to do a direct answer, we, we're pretty skeptical. We were pretty skeptical of the ownership of nature. Um, and this was just kind of a, a way to like, kind of broach the topic, like get it out there that this is the, the length that somebody's going to have to go to, to get around um, that kind of ownership. Um, and then almost like a turning to the dark side. I, I viewed it as a turning to the dark side at the end when they put the patent label on there. Cause like, I don't think that crop should be patented to begin with, but <laughs> um, so I guess I see what you were saying that our position isn't as clear in the film itself, but that's where we were coming from. 
Yeah, I, I really appreciate your response. And maybe, maybe just as a, I'm sure you tried other, other things, but maybe just even switching up the audio to something drastically different, you know what I mean? Like how would that change the narrative in some ways and the reception of the narrative? Mm -hmm. Like I, I would be personally really interested to, to see what that would, what effect that would have. Thank you. We think we'll move on from there. Congratulations. It's mm. a stunning piece. Really great. I yeah. really love it. It's yeah. beautiful and um, we should both be very, very proud. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Jonathan and Melvin. This is better because I can do research well, here as well. In 2018, Dr. He Kui decided to perform germ cell editing onto an embryos in Shenzhen, making them resistant to AIDS and earning him the title of China's Gene Editing Frankenstein. This drew attention towards the irresponsible use of this technology, making an ethical lens become a necessity. <laughs> well, it sounds like he deserves a Nobel Prize, don't you think? He basically liberated two human girls from ever getting infected by HIV. <laughs> well, yes, but no. A lot of the concerns revolve around the use of this technology. It's definitely easy to do, but it's difficult to do it right. Dr. Her opened up the possibility for new The age of genetic engineering is evolving. New ways of administering Cas9 proteins and many more are under testing, making our lives a whole lot simpler with plenty to go around. What is Ono Industries doing to keep pace with these breathless changes? Well, here's an instrument that actually put them ahead of CRISPR engineers. The Resonometer. It works like an echolocator, sending out high frequencies that accurately map out the target DNA sequence. What took five men and nearly a week to produce can now be done in one afternoon. With the help of Billy, of course. In practically every sphere, progress has altered things almost beyond recognition. But with something rather personal, like DNA, little has changed in hundreds of years. However, something really new is this process of identifying and rectifying undesirable sequences. A compact machine capable of transforming the high frequencies of DNA strands into an audible wavelength allows us to properly and accurately determine what needs to be done. In order to administer the enzymes, a special substance may be applied onto any part of the body, much less invasive compared to the old needle. The face contains blood vessels closest to the surface of the skin, making absorption as easy as pie. With some additional ingredients, you can also get a facial as you wait for the substances to do their thing. Sorry we can't give you the formula for these substances, it's strictly top secret. In fact, all salons put a C-clamp on this kind of information. Ono has led the genetic engineering world, pioneering almost all the new processes. Today, Every new sequence scanned puts some obscure, unknown part of genetics in the book, allowing you to decide on the sequencing you deserve.
Hi, welcome everyone. Um, thank you for being here. Um, before we jumped in into our um, discussion, I guess, uh, we would like to introduce ourselves. My name is Melvin. And my name is Jonathan. Um, just a little bit about the project. Um, the reality that we're exploring hovers around the ethical dilemma of genetic engineering. With the rapid development of gene editing technology, CRISPR will no doubt fall victim to the corporate world. And as with any market, a monarchy will eventually emerge on new industries. This project illustrates the rise of new economic subsets that fall under the strict regulations imposed onto the world, in this case, a beauty and bakery. But how long would it be before someone decides to use the technology for something other than what's allowed? The real question comes down to the need for such high quality information in order to democratize this technology. Jamie Metzl, a technology futurist, states the following. By holding a line and saying that it's not ready to be applied in human appropriation, the more indefensible that line will be. The need for a global infrastructure is necessary, one that is not monopolized by a singular entity, but rather one that is distributed across a larger whole. With that being said, the only way to establish this is through conversations revolving around your agency within this field. It's not about how to dismantle the democratic structures, but rather how to enable them through the common voice of public intervention. Thank you. So yeah, we're just going to loop this video in the background. So ironically, while you're looping it, um, I thought it was, I loved the film for the fact it's a, almost a love affair with audio. It's a mm. complete love affair with audio. So it starts with conversations and you don't see the people. And the way you've paid so much attention to audio all the way through, which arguably audio is the kind of, could be a democratic, democratizing principle, which you're talking about, um, which you were indicating. So um, yeah, that's my comment really. I loved that attention and it becomes the, protag the protagonist for me actually in the whole film, yeah. I know I really agree with that, but also the way the sound kind of acts against the narrative and the music acts against the narrative. Is, is really powerful. In other words, it's not just illustrating what you're saying, it's kind of kicking against it. It's really good. Yeah, I agree. It really um, lends to the sort of comedy of the film itself when really at the end, um, when we see um, sort of Malvin, I forget what character you're playing exactly, but when we see you sort of use all of this technology in the wrong way like you know explicitly you, like overusing whatever that chemical compound is and and really sort of going over the top with it we start to I think that that opens up the like concern of this technology being sort of accessible to everyone you know like I'm wondering what your face looks like afterwards when you take that off like have you turned yourself into some like monstrosity? Like what does that create? And you know, um, yeah, it's just super, is is great. But I'm like, that's sort of what, what stuck with me the most is like, there's an irony and there's humor, but this is actually really terrifying. Um, Cause you could like, I mean, there's like un, un sort of unprecedented harm you could like cause yourself in doing this. Um, and I also want to commend you both on this sort of Wes Anderson micro model lab that you've like edited yourself into, Malvin. I think that was absolutely fantastic. I mean, I can see it behind the two of you and all I want to do is like look at that thing up close because it's phenomenal. Like I, I actually, I didn't realize it was like such a small scale and I love that you guys revealed that at the end of the film. I think this is really great.
I just wanted to add something to your presentation. I found it was very uh, exciting to see. I, I guess some of us have not sort of been to a 60s cinema or 50s cinema, but there was a BBC special series, which was almost like a post-war newsreel about particular events that were happening around the world. So I think your first part of the presentation almost felt like a BBC news series just after the war because the way you used the narrator and the way you produced the, uh, the sound quality was almost like a news feed. And then it changes, it's almost like a time lapse. It almost looks like, well, the startups become successful and it takes design as a kind of a, if, if you think about it, like I thought about a shotgun sequencing machine, which kind of sequences random DNA strands. And then if you overlap that with the kind of company like 23andMe, which essentially is a test kit that enables you to collect saliva and, and essentially gives you a whole bunch of information about sequencing your DNA. So there's a whole bunch of design potentials in your project, which starts to terminate a new way of perceiving. Uh, if I think about some of, the, some of the way design companies have been producing objects and product, it suddenly becomes a totally different engagement where science and, and design across different disciplines starts to come together to produce a kind of a homemade, if you think of a homemade 3D printer, but it's kind of a homemade genome sequencing printer, where you start to hack the kind of nature of the way scientific processes are produced and brings the kind of the user back into a kind of, a, I would call it a customization or automation of a kind of a self-made uh, sequencing. And that's what's kind of interesting because the, the, the machine that you produced is almost like the bright street bear by Duchamp. It's kind of alien because it actually doesn't have that high tech capability or sensibility, but it's almost like a way of you understanding the idea of the spinning wheel and the cog, which reminds you of certain, psychologically reminds you of certain shapes and forms that you relate to. So it takes the idea of this alien science and brings it back to a, to a kind of a very understood language, which is, is almost familiar. So I think that, that kind of idea of the, the design object mixed with science and the way you create a narration also gives you that time lapse from kind of a, what I thought was a kind of a 50s, 60s kind of a sensibility to a kind of a future driven history where you're pairing technology and design together. And I think Mar Marcus Frias might be able to say something about that as well, because he sees a lot of this. But I think the idea of a useless object suddenly becomes a very useful object, becomes, becomes an engaging object that actually does something. And it takes that idea of where we are right now in history, if you think about the Internet of Things and how companies are starting to pr produce objects that kind of speak to one another in the cloud, it kind of takes science and the hacking of the bio to a totally different level becomes responsible ecologically to the planet and its user base. I mean, I was kind of, it's, it's a sort of game of spot the genre, isn't it? A shot or spot the genre parody, because you mentioned the, the BBC newsreel from the newsreel, but there was also, I don't know if you, any of you remember more that TV character made of plasticine um, from from yeah. my childhood. And there was a bit of Buster Keaton in there and a bit of Wes Asenderson that someone said. And um, there was also like a, a, the titles were sort of from a, I don't know, an IBM info film from an expo maybe in 1976. <laughs> um, and even like David Shrigley was a bit in there. And then it was another illustration, which was, I don't know, sort of Mr. Magooish or something like that. I personally found that quite distracting. I wanted the film to have its own aesthetic, it kind of like genre hopped a little bit. And I found myself almost being um, drawn to the references rather than the, the story at times. Yeah, I would, I would definitely echo that. I mean, it was incredibly entertaining and I really appreciate the labor that went into this, but I also was a little confused about how the genre, like if it's satire, sort of where the critique lies specifically. I mean, uh, and to that end, like I think in terms of your presentation, I would have been, and I, again, I don't know this kind of like how this was framed by you, Lucy, but like I would really have been interested to hear more about sort of your, what who you, you were looking at, because I think some of the artistic references that seem to be made in here, like that I was picking up on may not even be intentional, but I was looking at thinking about Hannah Wilkie's work, um, her self-portraits around illness. 
um, because the motif of dots is something that she plays with in her kind of performative photo work. And then also even Ellen Gallagher's um, deluxe series, which uses a kind of plasticine overlay over drawings and specifically usually around, um, you know, she was kind of reappropriating ads, and kind of, uh, re rearticulating ads uh, made like basically beauty products around kind of identity transformation for African-Americans. And so, um, and so that sort of segues into sort of my um, comment about the parts to me that seem most um, provocative as a kind of critique are, is around the kind of intersection between bio biohacking and wellness. And so there were parts where it seemed like you were almost mimicking making a kind of like lotion or mask or something with like this kind of substance that you're playing with the plasticine um, that seemed like it could have like veered into a critique of like the kind of world of goop, you know, the um, and, and, and interestingly, also genetic engineering, biohacking, all of that has roots in eugenics too, if you think about the history of sort of how those things came about. So, um, so yeah, I would be super interested in hearing, you know, from, from you, like how, you know, if, if, if some of those in references were coming through, or if those are just me just sort of reading into this in a different way, or, um, and, and sort of what you were thinking and looking at. So I think some of the references that you mentioned, um, definitely we, we did not look at those, um, but I think I can answer more directly to the, the mash of genres that were appearing in the film. Um, I think the idea of distraction is, is intentional. Uh, we live in a very highly distracted society right now where there's a bunch of information that comes in together. And um, we leave a lot of the important conversations to the experts, but in something as sensitive as DNA and genetic engineering, I think the ethical dilemma is actually trying to involve the public in something that they should have agency in. And so distraction was actually a, a kind of, um, was kind of another window for us to like start to introduce the common public. Maybe, I mean, I have a couple of kind of random points uh, that probably doesn't amount to a, a, a solid comment whatsoever, but uh, uh, is, I think it's a it's a tour de force, totally enjoyable to watch. So that that's fantastic to, to keep the attention on the audience. I think your project to me raised two or three issues, which I find is super contemporary. One, it has this kind of a, I mean, and I think Tom and Marcos mentioned about the old things in movies and BBC and so on. But there were there was a completely underline of propaganda. So to me, your project it has an underline to be a propaganda to to a kind of a call call to the arms, uh, which I think is also an interesting way to think about, for example, the, the more the more that technology advanced, we become and more technology and more um, scientific research became available to us. At the same time, there's a counterbalance from the rising also of the organic, handmade, self-made um, things that we get bombarded with as well, which are all part of the same machine. So to me, your project starts to produce an interesting intersection about that, this idea to, in a strange way, by these mechanisms to demystify that. Like, uh, I don't know, like, it, 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 like if you go to SpaceX and you go inside, it doesn't look at all like the thing what we saw from the movie in NASA. Actually, it, lo it looks almost like a FedEx or UPS kind of thing. It's completely demystified the space. So there is this idea of, the, the day by day banalization of, uh, of uniqueness, which I think your project does in a very interesting and sophisticated way. So, so it, as a start way to think about that this is something um, that you can start doing on your own. So uh, to me that, that, that there, is a, there is a very interesting kind of a underlying critical element to that, but at the same time blending what I will say there are two parallel narratives that we're going through uh, in the culture of science and design. As I said, the more the more than we produce sophisticated tools and and toys and mechanisms, at the same time, there is more and more rising of this kind of a uh, art design, traditional thing, rethought, and to start to uh, and your film to me is start to merge those two worlds. So I, I in that sense I find it incredibly provocative, because it's it's it keeps the tension of that ambiguity. All, all the way. I mean, the, with the, the, the cinematic techniques that we use that belong clearly to different time with soundtrack and everything. So um, I find it in that sense, um, in, in incredibly contemporary now in the present kind of project. I, I, I don't find it as a science fiction, a speculative thing, but I find it 
like a super concrete right now. This is something that I can imagine putting into, into action as we speak. I think Hernan, can I add something to Hernan's comment? I really love your comments about how you you sort of amplify the object and the kind of the idea of the speculative nature of 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 design. But I think you and I both remember that, you know, we were both had some histories with a company called Alessi in Italy. And if you think about the kind of nature of the way kind of contemporary company produces objects and how you you kind of create a, a commercial visual entity to distribute the idea of design to the world. If I, if I can imagine how this object itself, because it's kind of an unpacking, you can sort of see there was kind of like an object unpacking. And it's one of the most interesting things for all of us, maybe for me, maybe, is when you, you know, what's in the box. The idea when you get the Apple computer, I get excited about the box or the iPhone, but then when I open it, I lose that perspective and I think, oh, what the hell, it's just a phone. But the unpacking is the kind of interesting thing. And it's just something phenomenal about the way the movie, the narration then unpacks the object. And you don't see a design object, but you see a whole bunch of a bunch of scientific elements. Then when you sort of constitute these together, they actually have a life of their own. So I, I sort of kind of think this, I'm not speaking about Alessi in general, but I'm thinking about design companies, the way they try to package an, an experience. And I think this experience, when you sort of see this, this, this experimentation come together in this beautiful object that you kind of unpack, that experience takes you to a completely le different level. And it's dealing with, with, with uh, a logic which you have to have some kind of a, I mean, there's a risk involved in that, but there's also a kind of a you know, sequence of assembly or kit of parts that is so intriguing. So I think all of us, you know, when we think about the experience of unpacking information, unpacking data, then unpacking the final, which you call the physical element, which in a way the design familiarizes us with something, gives us a kind of a human element but we're still speaking about, I guess, human genome. We're still speaking about hacking science. We're still speaking about a lot today about, you know, what's the transdisciplinary. And I get kind of really annoyed sometimes because we don't get that kind of transdisciplinary narrative. And I'm, I guess I'm seeing it here for the first time um, in, a, in a kind of a, you know, kind of an element which brings together a sequence of creativity, science, design in a kind of really transdisciplinary way where things come together as an alternative experience. And I kind of, I'm thinking about going to Selfridges and, you know, going down to the, to the makeup department and you've got this incredible object and this object is unpacked and it becomes part of your life. And, you know, you, you're entering another world where we sort of sequencing chromosomes, where we're sequencing assemblies of proteins. And that's kind of like that 21st century model, perhaps that Hannah and you saying it's very much of its time because we are now much more aware of vaccines. We are much more aware of, <clears throat> you know, science in a way that is kind of, in a way, um, presented to us in a commercialized or a narrative. So whether it's fake news or real news, uh, the idea that we have this new way of understanding the world, and you can sort of say, well, the world is ready for that kind of understanding where we take everyday objects that are kind of, you know, previously you could say we're just dumb objects that are kind of stylized or fashionized now become part of our everyday life where there, there's an intelligence and it starts to bleed over between different elements of you know, science, design, art, cinema, and cinematic. And it kind of produces you a completely different pathway to understanding how the world could be reimagined in terms of design. Anyway, that's my, that's my gargle on that. <clears throat> as, a, as a bit of film, we've talked about how it kind of genre hops relentlessly. But the, the fact that you two are in it, I think that's my favorite bit of it. The fact that you've put yourself in the front of the camera, you're both really expressive actors, actually. And, um, and, uh, and I, saw, I just realized another reference in, in the suits. It's very kind of, there's this very sort of early James Bond thing going on there with those sort of bluey gray suits. But um, I think, whereas the last, I, I wouldn't say it was a criticism of the previous piece that it didn't have a protagonist. It worked with that one, but you guys are the protagonists in this. And I think you pull it off. <laughs> you, you're able to to get into all those different genres really, really well. I think that's something that you could explore in the future. It's um, it's quite unique that you can 
be on both sides of the camera and, and enjoy it so much. I will add that three weeks ago, they decided to do green screen. <laughs> so, and at, having never done it before. So the building of the model and the learning of all of that production, um, the miniature, you know, <laughs> that was happened three weeks ago and all the sound, Melvin's orchestrated that on the guitar and um, Jonathan, we finally saw you in the film because you resisted and I was delighted to finally see your face there. So I'm glad that um, both of you became the protagonists. You've worked yeah. relentlessly. <laughs> Sorry, Marcus. Yeah, they look great. And that those, those sequences where there's that kind of weird concrete wall behind them and they're wearing those sort of biohazard hoods, that feels like the beginning of their own aesthetic. There's one that comes from them rather than being sort of from a, a book of film. Yeah, the first references were Betty Boot. They were really, have always been a foundation. I think mostly from you, Jonathan, that was kind of, I think I remember those references and Malvin has a background in theatre. Um, but also as a, as a process, Malvin bakes, Jonathan loves coffee and they started with coffee and dough and that's where they started. And these are my words. You also fight a lot. Like you kind of have these deep discussions and have very different um, ideas about the project. So um, it, it's uh, such an incredible masterpiece that you've done in 15 weeks, having, ne having never done this before. So um, well done. Mm, thank you. Yeah, congratulations. Thanks everyone for the comments. We can do one more and then have a break. I'm, I'm so happy that those in London are staying. Let's quickly move on, Lynn and Bianca. So, hi everyone, thank you for coming. My name is Bianca and this is my partner, Lynn. Our film titled For Lily takes place in the year 2067, when most people have been gen genetically modified. Genetic modification has become the new normal. Everyone has the intelligence, beauty, and health they desire. However, we projected that the main side effect of these very common genetic modifications is that it has removed unique traits in all of us. Without these diverseness, uh, humanity has lost a sense of creativity, limiting their originality and collective weirdness. Imagine a world where we were unedited, free from our CRISPR DNA. I know that CRISPR fed the world, but what about us? I kind of
um, these are our process photos and some prop photos, and we're just going to have it on the loop. And as well as some progress throughout the semester. So it's more of a question for the two of you than a comment. I'm wondering if you can both speak to your use of paint as a material. Hmm. Um, so if we wait a little bit, there's actually another slide after this. So in the very beginning of the semester, I think uh, we started with these codes that really we really didn't know what it really means or what is actually going to do for our films, um, and then we started to write them in some in terms of some kind of um, codes or some kind of new language that somehow describes the new uh, this CRISPR technology or the gene sequences that we have right now, and then we were just um, these are some process uh, process photos where we turned them into some kind of um, like a like an artifact where it could be used in uh, regular daily lives that um, somehow maybe these represent something that it will help us in terms of modifying something and genetically in, in, um, instead of um, literally injecting a CRISPR to us and then have it as some kind of like uh, some kind of way to modify our gen genes. But these are some kind of like daily uh, things that they can work in a way. But we, at midterms, we figured out it's not really working um, effectively. And then we ended up um, thinking about these codes, like what does it really do and how it's going to affect the CRISPR. And then we were, um, we were saying, uh, me and Bianca were both saying that what if it's something that's like undoes, undoes the CRISPR, like um, at the end of the, or uh, one day after all CRISPR has become very common that we have been all crispr and we were having uh, something that we have everything, we have all the health, um, there's no sickness anymore and everyone's beautiful and purity, everyone's like having all kinds of intell intellectual and um, some kind of uh, beauty that they desire. At that point, sometimes maybe we will lose our originality that maybe CRISPR doesn't help us in a way where we want to advance ourselves instead of it actually degrades ourselves in a way that we would maybe want to have some kind of original DNA instead of like editing them all. So I'm actually more interested in those, ta those studies you did, um, the sort of tattoos. I think your film was great, but it's, the plot's a little bit hard to understand. Like, I'm not sure what um what the protagonist is sort of set on doing right and finding in sort of discovering all of these or, or being given all of this information like what's the goal right um i think that was a little unclear at the end um but i think i'm really fascinated by sort of the the language that you guys have started to create and i would have loved to see that sort of make its way into the film because I'm really in like this idea of sort of um codifying our like gen our genes and and um representing them like with actual markers on our bodies I think is um an interesting concept yeah yeah and they're beautiful thank you so that's something that we thought about as well like in terms of tattooing or mm -hmm. placing on the body but and, and even edibles or wearables. Mm -hmm. That's something that we were interested like towards midterm. I think oh, oh. the message of the Anthropocene in this, in this particular movie is very powerful. Um, I don't think you realized it, but you're sort of, you crafted a book that's sort of the history of what, what was, right? And the past that we can't go back to. Um, I think that is something that is very, very powerful. It's something that we sort of keep doing right. We uh, we started with with cave paintings, 
you know, we ended up with this book of, of, of hieroglyphs in the language that is very specific to particular things that we did at some point through our, through our um, expansion, right, of, 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 uh, of, of a species. And I think that maybe you sort of missed the point, but I think I, I saw it right when the movie started, that, that sort of um, how the species is able to carry us through through this sort of collection of, of, of ideas, right, that we, in a way or another, find a way to sort of imprint it into into future generations, right? Maybe we can't come back to it, right? And maybe it's a it's a it's a lost past that no matter what we do is just always going to be in the back of our minds, right? But is it's a very powerful message in that sense that is that is sort of a collective of things that we've done and they sort of have paved the the way for us to get to where we are. Yeah, I must admit, I didn't really know what was going on in the film, but I did kind of, probably it was because I was distracted by the visual language you, which you've created, which I found really beautiful and evocative and something of your own. And I kept thinking of, you know, the kind of the, the I don't know whether they were real or not, but the, the mythical hobo signs that they would paint, like good food at this house or stay away, angry dog. It's like some kind of language that's there in your face but not everyone has the tools to unlock it and i really thought that it was really powerful when then we went and you cut to that that building with the, the 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 symbol on top i mean did you actually build that or is that kind of a bit of trickery it was like suddenly you see this thing that is in handcrafted pop-up books and painted on bags and it's all a bit kind of lo-fi and then suddenly there's oh there's an institute somewhere and it's got, and it's the logo. It was all a bit like, oh, you know, the kind of um, um, close encounters moment when he suddenly realizes the mountain is, is real. It was kind of a, like a wake up call, but I was, I was also thinking, did you actually go up there and put that thing up there or? <laughs> <laughs> I think um, symbols are also really clever. They're really, Really it's kind of funny because throughout making these codes so at some point in the semester um this is a building that we actually found but it kind of looked exactly like the code that we crafted by hand <laughs> so then we ended up superimposing it on the actual building so it ended up working out pretty weirdly but well at the same yeah. time yeah, and ir right. ironically, this place was pediatric, which really fit well to our kind of plot we have. Because the film kind of starts off with this child yeah. speaking about this idea of how we're overly crispered and how eventually maybe one day everyone will be alike in some sense. So yeah, visually, I think that it's a very strong, very coherent, very kind of mysterious. I really liked so it was sort of mirror esque some of the symbols and um, very reminded me of Howard Hodgkin, some of the colors. Yeah, Howard Hodgkin's meets Miro. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but like, like Marcus, I really I loved the kind of visual language of it, but I found the narrative difficult, and I, I guess it raised for me the question of what, what would be the right medium for your idea and I kind of really wanted to get my hands on the book <laughs> and just spend time with the book <clears throat> and I loved that kind of idea of the pop-up book and the flaps and the like a sort of children's book and I think it's sometimes yeah a question you need to ask yourself is what is the right medium for my idea rather than fitting the medium mm -hmm. the idea the idea has to fit the medium I think there is a, the dialogue that I'm hearing here is very interesting in terms of how we started to displace the idea of logos and branding and moving away from a kind of pragmatic uh, understanding of the world to a much more engaging understanding of the world and the way we sequence the world in different ways. So I, getting back to some of the discussions before about the, you know, the idea of, of art and visual storytelling 
in a way, if you look at Aboriginal art, it there, it has um, a basis for understanding the world through through its symbols and icons and dots and so forth. So I love the idea that you sort of look at a narrative from understanding of a kind of a deeper history, which is which is kind of an epoch, not just not just something short term, but it has a deeper understanding of what humanity and and the world may be about and he kind of touches these things very well in, in its the way it describes that so i think the idea of of uh, rationalizing the symbols and logos and then transforming the idea of healthware and genome and you know sequencing of dna to become much more prevalent and if i think about what are the only companies that would actually use logos in that scale were really petroleum companies uh, exxon uh, shell BP and so forth. So these symbols kind of symbol symbolize buildings as being part of kind of a language system. But the idea to open this up to a kind of a, a, a deeper understanding of what I think is interesting is it's almost like I was looking at a kind of a collabing between say Chanel as a company and, uh, and, a, and a DNA or a sequencing company that is yet to emerge. <clears throat> and I was thinking about, you know, Craig Venter Institute, the way they they produce synthetic biology and the way they sequence the DNA and so forth. So idea of, the idea of rationalizing and humanizing science and bringing design science together as a different way of, you know, if you think about uh, body mapping, if you think about how we sequence each individual and so forth, there's a way of maybe understanding design through the way we wear uh, things that are invisible, such as perfumes or or, or, or healthcare products. In many ways that a mask in doing COVID identified you as somebody who was, you know, who was protecting themselves and others. And there were people, of course, the non-maskers who obviously sent a message as well. So, you know, the way we socialize, the way we understand uh, the world through uh, materiality, uh, fashion, objects and forms, they say so much about the world, but the idea that we becoming intelligent, that this becomes in a way of, I'm looking at this image, editing the future uh, is, a very, is a very symbolic way of, of taking uh, something that is usually um, very rational, very misunderstood to something that's very engaging. And I think that's what I love about your sequencing of the narrative. In a way, it, it's, it's almost like an Etsy world. I can download this on Etsy or I can have a whole bunch of artists that can create uh, a a kind of a, a world which we I collaborate with, which means that a design and artist can become part of this dialogue. And we, in, in a way, we place ourselves in this world through these objects and we start to understand the world as a, a much more um, prevalent, engaging um, and analytic system rather than just something that's a passive system. So this engagement is a very, very interesting way of taking something that's very removed from our human understanding, which because it's not visible to making it visible and saying something about the wearer or the user and some, something new about the world. And also our place in the world as being much more aware and engaged with, with science and medicine and you know, in this world of vaccines and it's taken that kind of science into a kind of front page news. And the way you're producing this is very off its time. You could say it's very contemporary and it's, it's very encouraging to see this type of, type of development. And I think the other thing is that a lot of, I was thinking before companies like Balenciaga, you know, who are trying to sell fashion to this, this, in this current phase, they're also using kind of trying to lowering their, uh, or lowering their um, commercial filmmaking and narratives down to this kind of level, which is kind of like saying you, me and everybody else, rather than you and not everybody else, sorry, us and not you which means engaging at street level. And you can always imagine this is kind of streetwear science where you're bringing something that's very kind of laboratory based into the street and engaging with the public. And it also makes it appear like it's an everyday object that everybody can produce with an iPhone. So therefore it takes this idea of untouchable to a kind of a more, more accessible, if you know what I mean. So it's a very interesting way, the way you produce the narrative to bring it down from kind of a high fashion, high style, you know, Alexander the Queen comes streetwear, comes wearwear, means science wear. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I think some of this um, very modernist sort of syntax of forms they're using, I think that's where for me, where I started to get really a bit confused because you know, there's a point at which 
like this pop-up book is where I sort of like, I don't, the, it, it's like these mix of references that don't seem to totally align in ways that for me seem cohesive. Um, but I think what would have been, what could be really interesting is, uh, and I don't know if you, you had looked into this, but par- some of the things that you're referencing do respond to the sort of history of science. And um, in particular, when you, there's a, there's a scene where you almost kind of make a, a kind of fake daguerreotype kind of slide and then you project it on the wall. And um, the historian of science, um, Graham Burnett wrote a really interesting essay about the automatic microtome. And um, it's, he curated a, an exhibition called uh, The Slice Cutting to See. And basically um, this machine, which, is, which was used for many years, basically would cut paper thin sections of, of tissue um, you know, it could be like a mouse's heart, it could be an eyeball, it could be, you know, anything. And then basically you put it onto a slide just like this and then it projects. So it's this moment in which the bodily section and mass becomes a kind of animation um, and an image. And so there's a really interesting kind of architectural thing happening in that moment within the history of science. Um, I, I can put it, drop it in the link, but I think like some of those kinds of really interesting moments where design, science, like there's a, they have those very fluid intersections could be moments that you could borrow from when you think about, you know, deriving your scripts or thinking about certain kinds of technologies and how quote unquote new technologies or future technologies, um, you know, ha- have a kind of conversation with this, with this history of technology. Um, so it just made me think of that really. And, and I just sort of wonder if like in, in a similar way with the kind of proprietary nature of the first presentation we saw, the first film around fungi, if, if there's a way in which more of a position in some ways could be taken around the proprietary nature of, of you know, human identity or however you want to phrase that. So, um, and I don't know that I, I totally get a, a position from you as like authors of this film um, about, about where you stand, because pr- primarily because I think some of the, the visual signifiers in this are, seem a little bit confusing to me. And, and I, th- I think lead me to places where you know, I'm thinking about like modernist painting and, and all these things that maybe aren't really central to what you're actually trying to advance as a, as a kind of conceptual framework. I think it's been like this, even since the midterm or before the midterm that we've been really struggling, like where this kind of the new language that we've created or this code will uh, sit in a place or what kind of genre that it'll fit into in terms of uh, narrative. And I think the narrative has been like the biggest obstacle we've had since throughout the whole semester. It wasn't like a problem of us making this new uh, new codes or these like logos or what is it gonna actually mean has been a uh, big question for us. And I think like those comments really help in terms of like the branding that um, uh, Tom, I think, uh, uh, mentioned about, and then also about how these can be uh, placed in some kind of modern painting instead of, like, I think we kind of forced a little bit in terms of how we can uh, put it. And I think we really tried hard to uh, connect them in terms of like our genes and how these codes can somehow represent it in terms of these codes and the, the gene sequences. Um, I'm sure you, like these really help, these comments were very helpful. Like, I think- Sorry to interrupt you. I think like this could be the moment where even if you went back and reworked the section, right, where um, the projection is where you can kind of maybe mess with the graphics and, and After Effects or something. But um, uh, but there's that kind of translation that I'm missing, like between thinking about the privatization of the body as like as data, basically, right, and and then to thinking about. But so there's like a. <laughs> There's a kind of um, confusion that I'm, or or a gap that I'm missing. And maybe even just like having graphics in this particular moment could be a way to flesh that out. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think I think every week come with something new. Today's moving into the bathroom. You've converted your kitchen into a photo studio. You've taught yourself the camera. Um, it's been wonderful to just watch 
the iterations. And I think, Esther, the, the narrative has been a real struggle um, because there was there, memory was the thing that they really wanted to explore from the very beginning. And, and part of the studio was to have no preconceptions and to just let what you make determine the narrative. So, um, yeah, I, I can see why you've picked up on that and I, I think you both can, can relate to that. But I'm, I'm so thrilled with how the project has, has come to life, especially in the last three weeks. It's, like, drastically improved. So well done. Okay, so we'll, we've got two more groups. So we've got 50 minutes um, longer. We'll, we'll take a five-minute break. The next group is um, Asia and Lauren. So stick around if you can. Yeah. Thanks, Lucy. Thank you. Great to see everybody. Uh, great work, amazing resolution, fantastic to see, and uh, congratulations. Thanks, Tom. Bye. I'm gonna try and stay to the end, Lucy, if I don't um, collapse. Pour yourself another glass of wine. <laughs> I'm out of wine now, but I've got my tea ready. Okay. Ready go. See you, Marcus. Speak soon. Bye. Send you an email, Tom. I'll get back to you soon. Thank you. Bye bye. Hi, John. Hi, Lucy. Thanks for joining us. Oh, I'm really happy to. <laughs> This is great, Lucy. Thanks for inviting me. Oh, I'm pleased you could make it. I've never done this with um, this kind of medium before. I mean, uh, move. Yeah, I think the, um, well, like normal, the entire studio is a, an experiment, but this one's been particularly um, sort of very much cultivating uncertainty. <laughs> Uh, working from home and building props from home and working in teams. That's also been really sort of great to see people working remotely and coming together. It's, it's brought about new ways of making new kind of pipelines. Um, and I, I think that these limitations have uh, created even bigger ideas, if that makes sense, because of the limits. The first one was amazing. Oh my God. Really. Yeah, um, Hans is, I don't know if Hans is still on the line. His mum lives in Seattle and I think it was the week before midterm, um, he was going there. And so we, we, we were like, where are you going? Send us photos of your mum's house. <laughs> And so that whole first part of the film was shot on um, at his family home week six. And so then that was also, so locations become props in a way and they, their bodies become props. So everything yeah. becomes sort of something that can be used in the world <laughs> somehow. A lot of improvisation. All right. I don't know if Jonathan's going to come back. We're still at Somerset House. Asia and Lauren, are you ready to, to begin? We'll just wait another couple of minutes for Ariane and... Oh, yeah. Yeah, I will... Get ready, share your sound. Yes. Yay, Ariane's back. Yep, I'm <laughs> eating mandarins. Oh, nice. What? What is it, midnight now or? Uh, coming up, isn't wow. it? Wow. Yeah, quarter two. I'm not doing Marcus's trick with wine. I'll just go to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, mandarins. I might too, but let's see. <laughs> John, John's been, John's teaching at SIARC and has been from London. So I don't even know. Lisa, how I got, I got nocturnal. Yeah. I live on LA time. No. I get about two hours of daylight per day. 
<laughs> in, the, in the solar north. Clive, how are you doing over there? Hanging, hanging in there. Hanging in there? Yeah, no, good. Oh, it's great you can join us. All right. Esther, you're, you're good to go. Thank you for... Thank you so much for staying. I know you're in New York, so it's coming into your evening, I guess. All right, Asia, Lauren. Let me share our screen. Okay. So, um, hi, my name is Lauren. And my name is Asia. And we come from two very different backgrounds of study. So I have a degree in microbiology from UC Berkeley, and then I worked in Hollywood in the entertainment industry for a number of years after that. And I always been interested in human body and clothing. Um, and I have a huge passion on um, self-awareness and journey of each person takes um, and been active um, about and come from a society where um, I think communal needs is always put in front of personal needs and personal um, freedom. So that's going to be important later. <laughs> so we found the idea of combining both our backgrounds. So science with like fashion, spirituality, incredibly interesting because of the way both fields um, are constantly moving forward and evolving. And that's really what drove our process. And I think both fields affect the, the way of life a, a lot. Um, and we wanted to see, I mean, through our process, we wanted to see how could clothing um, affect a person's place in society and or how a clothing can be physically or chemically affect the body. So could uh, a second skin be created in order to optimize and control the body or to create some sort of interface through which communication can be achieved? We uh, played around with science, scientific concepts as well as physical materials in order to come up with a background story where uh, a government run society is created and through CRISPR, a perfect society is used by editing its members and taking away or controlling the expression of self-desire. So to create more altruistic society and altruistic utopia. So this year actually in 2020, scientists discovered a key brain enzyme controlling desire um, in specific regions of the brain tissue. And by injecting a hybrid nanoparticle viral vector system locally into the muscle, it can transduce tissues that are naturally immune uh, privilege such as the brain. So um, there is a way to turn on and off this enzyme, which removes the need for desire being expressed in the brain, which means it's literally been edited out. Um, and also this year, we actually lived through something that we never thought would we imagine. We lived through a pandemic. And I think especially in the United States, um, we have seen a lot of um, selfish acts of people not putting on masks or respecting people around. That's why I said I come from a society where people um, really worry about those things. Um, and then, so the concept came from that controlling specific desire through genetic editing was believed in the society to be the only way mankind can achieve stability and peace and to put communal needs ahead of personal gain. A caste system places the highest intelligence in control of society and an effect in control of future generations to come. Through this um, short movie, in a way, um, we follow a character who's in a lower caste group, somehow awakened from this life uh, with no self-desire. And what would her inner journey be going through this new feeling of wanting to be more, to be, uh, to, to be superior within the society in a way away from what she was um, told to be um, and what kind of emotion they would go through. So basically um, this short film 
talks about what happens if science itself breaks down and human nature is allowed to break through.
so right so um we kind of wanted this to continue as a discussion because um the film itself i think um film itself focuses very much on i guess um society where in the future would it be uh, a positive thing to edit out this self desire or would it be a negative thing which i i we as a group think i don't think it's it's yes or no question i think it's the fact that um this concept of utopia and dystopia being separate identities commonly we always see it as narrative i think uh, th through this we wanted to discover the society where like both utopia and dystopia uh simultaneously exists together and i think that's already also what in a world where we live currently where for example, social media specifically is can be a nightmare, but also the best thing ever where you can reach out to people that you haven't seen in years thanks to wonders of social media, where in the past people weren't able to do that and connect with older friends and every uh, and friends that you haven't had or family members that you have lives on the other part of the planet. Um, especially since both um, Lauren's mother comes from immigrant, immigrant background and so do I where I can contact my family um, so much easier. However, there is this undeniable fact of false information that's spread around social media where it actually damages society a lot. And I think that's why I, in a current age, we're living in this uh, world of utopia and dystopia together and um, kind of debating about this alpha mentality that we found in mammals, which is basically us. Um, but through our intelligence, we kind of dull some parts of it some violent parts of it where we don't um, battle with each other over who's gonna be the alpha anymore. But in in the current society, we do intentionally and in, uh, unintentionally hurt those around us or those who work for us um, to achieve, to be more or to be in a higher position within the society. And this hurting can be indirectly, um, you could be buying something from, um, a supermarket that uses child labor without even knowing and that also happens because of this need to have more money or be someone bit better by like earning money and by using people around you and i think it's a huge problem especially in covid where people are not wearing masks because it's um they state that it's personal freedom um but they're potentially risking someone who might be at risk or stating or saying things like um that if they're at risk, they should stay home, completely ignoring these people's rights to have the freedom to go outside safely um, and go ab about their days, go to grocery stores or walk outside to take a breath or walk their dogs. Um, and I think it's very damaging to our society that we're so focused on um, what our personal freedom means. So the world we created is speculating by taking away these tendencies to care about um, our own freedom, but not just freedom, like our, our own needs only, but focusing on um, a common goal, uh, 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 focusing on this altruistic society. Um, and the question is, if you take away desire, when does sexuality, is sexuality also taken away? Um, and when do we lose our humanity? Mm, so you're packing a lot in there. Um, what fascinated me was the ending of the film as the human body becomes more and more present through liquid and liquidity. And I found that really interesting that the body suddenly has a, at the beginning it feels one dimensional, you frame and project things onto it but when the body starts becoming more most present is when you bring in the liquid element you the body is submerged in water and you have a really strong sense of physicality and um yeah i was really fascinated by that towards the end the kind of corporality which came through
Yeah, I think also the idea of um, the less, when she doesn't have that armor on anymore, she's like taking it off, it becomes closer and closer to um, her losing that control or like feeling more of that inner struggle of these like feelings of desire, of need, of want and of self. So by the time she ends up like in the water, that's very present. I think um, I think there's some really successful moments uh, in terms of like shorter clips that you have, like moments of superimposition um, where you play with scale or the coloration, like this image, for example. I think I think there's some really interesting moments of like that where the surre surreality um, as an aesthetic, you know, makes brings you to like I don't know, it's probably not the right reference, but like Maya Darren films, for example, where you kind of start to enter into a kind of world of, of a kind of psychosis or some kind of inner psychological state. But I, I think where I sort of struggle in understanding this beyond its lyricism um, in, and correlating it to sort of all the ideas that you've mentioned is that the symbolism within this is so self-referential that it's really difficult for me to relate it to other things in the world. Um, and part of it could be that, um, uh, you know, there's a lot of films that can just work with like very kind of uh, a repertoire of props and kind of choreography or, or kind of performance within a space. But I, I think right now for me, the the kind of semantics that you're, the kind of lexicon that you're working with right now is, is so, it's rooted in a kind of symbolism that's so specific to your subjectivity that it's really hard for me as a viewer to understand how this might relate to, you know, um, some of these kinds of like issues, questions around technology or, um, uh, yeah, so, you know, all, all, all these other things that you discussed. Um, and so I sort of wonder if if it, it might even just be an issue of maybe like a slightly tighter edit of really thinking carefully, like at these moments that, uh, you know, start to play with scalar shifts or start to play with a kind of language of superimposition uh, more explicitly and also uh, a kind of performance of the body that that maybe something else might emerge from that. Um, because I, I do think that there was a little bit of like repetition throughout that I don't know that really served the work, uh, even just as a kind of like lyrical, uh, kind of dreamlike lyrical kind of experimental, uh, you know, piece of, of, you know, filmmaking. Um, yeah, so I think that's where I would put it. Like, I think if, if, if you are interested in some of thinking more about biopolitics or I, for me, there needs to be some, there needs to be some kind of like referent to that, like, so that I can, I can bring that into the conversation. But right now, the reading is is so sort of latent within your own your own kind of internal discourse around you know the ideas that you're interested in. Yeah, I, I agree with this. I thought the opening sequence was amazing. I mean, I thought it was so striking and beautiful and kind of like weird. Thinking, right, right. This is this is really the technique is just nailed. It's just really. I don't really care about the narrative. If I'm enjoying the visuals, it's showing me beautiful stuff. But it did, it was structurally, it was, then went back to that and then some else, and then the, the kind of the, the quality of the visuals sort of went a bit downhill, if I might say so. So I kind of, and, and this shot with the diagonal was like, there's some, there's some visual things in there, really beautiful, but I didn't think it. I feel like it moved on in a narrative way and in an aesthetic way, in the way that I was hoping it would. It was the kind of fireworks at, at the beginning, like the the mood, the mood didn't change very much. It got a bit kind of muddier and gloomier. The the the, the heartbeat thing got faster. I was was hope I was would have loved to have it, the music to have been a bit more driving the narrative rather than simply through the tempo as well. Like these shots are just amazing, really good. I just put um, an image in the chat, forgive me, because I can't, I don't have the full um, metadata, but it's the cover of um, uh, 
a study of a history of performance art by uh, A.A. Bronson and Peggy Gale. And the, the name I'm looking for is the name of the artist whose work is featured on, on, on the front. Um, uh, I believe she's an Austrian performance artist working in the uh, 1970s. Maybe somebody can ha help me out. But one of the key components of her work, just thinking, responding to Esther's comment about how does one situate this in a kind of world outside of itself. I think there is somewhere to be found, um, a kind of powerful history of the, uh, the image, one image projected on an, another image. And, but in the case of this performance artist's work, there's a number of these performances um, where um, a very specific kind of iconography, which is other to the body concerned, is projected on it to produce um, this kind of tension and conflict between a regime of representation and the body. There are other sequences in which she performs uh, various kind of actions on these, um, on superimpositions of her own image, and uh, I guess kind of uh, stereotypes, gendered images within kind of uh, art history. So I think that, and I mean, another instance that I was kind of thinking of where a projected image comes in contact with a body is of course that, that moment in um, Blade Runner 2049, where the, um, the kind of projected image of the uh, the kind of virtual beloved is projected on the body of a kind of stand-in uh, figure, and uh, you know that 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 brings in a whole other kind of discourse of like biopolitics and the relationship between kind of image and control and power. So, but those those I guess I bring those up because they maybe start to find some coordinates where you could situate this in, in the world. Because I, I, I do agree that it seems, um, seems very kind of internal to itself. And um, I don't know if you, maybe that was a kind of choice that you made, um, or if there is a kind, of, um, uh, a kind of social context in which you would situate this within a world. Um, is this part, like I'm interested where the kind of edges of the world are what's outside of this specific scene? Are we, are we kind of looking into um, a kind of, some kind of a real space? Is it, um, is it a kind of private space? Where does it meet the kind of rest of the world? You called the piece um, Civitas. And I, maybe this is kind of part of maybe what I'm trying to get at is that Civitas is like a highly kind of like public word, right? That it, it implies some kind of a forum, some kind of a larger, broader social political context. How do you kind of situate this in relation to that, that broader world? I mean, I think, um, well, when we were doing it, I, I don't, we weren't at all thinking actually how I don't, uh, we, that it was internalized. I mean, we're watching a character's internal struggle. That's yes, but I don't. I didn't. We didn't see it. I guess we couldn't see it as um, a personal um, direction because you're seeing two characters. That's um, uh, that's on the screen. Yeah, it's us, but it's not. It's it's you following a journey of this protagonist through um, um, of trying to be, uh, trying to imagine or dream in a dream st state uh, of wanting to be the other person. Um, and I guess it, it came from, the name definitely came from the concept of creating a society, uh, a communal society. So um, I, for us, the title meant, um, the title was to express the concept that we were moving forward with. I guess um, also we kind of wanted to leave it abstract because we wanted um, a desire is a very personal thing for each person, yes. But um, we didn't want to express what kind of desires are taking or we didn't want to express um, what specifically the society would have looked like because we wanted each uh, person who was watching the film to feel it themselves or imagine it themselves um, because the concept is to question this utopian dystopia existing together and desire is such a touchy topic, topic that's different for each person 
um, we didn't want to create a world that you're like, okay, so this is what it's like, but more like, what would this world be for me? Like, I guess, leave a conflict of, is it a good thing or a bad thing? So <clears throat> I'm I'm not in Los Angeles time, so this might be somewhat uh, uh, dozy. But you know, Lauren, what you started speaking about about identifying this enzyme that that is that is linked to desire, not attraction, desire, is it? The uh, yes, desire. Because yeah. I wasn't quite clear about that. In some parts of the movie, you, people are eating, and there are sort of other there is other sensory, um, so other sensorial sort of um, activity going on, but and in the you know a, a lot of what is going on in my head is as a result of the the commentary what yourself and um, is that Asia Asia have have mentioned like for instance the thing about social media that we you know that in our in our conventional interactions, there is all sorts of brain chemistry that is that is stimulated, both cortisol, oxytocin, a bunch of other, a bunch of other stuff. In other words, things that are empathetic and and affectionate and um, attractive and so on, as opposed to things that are aggressive or critical or or, or, or whatnot. Whereas, apparently, in social media, it, it tends to only it tend we tend not to generate cortisol so the sort of the village effect of having all of these inconsequential interactions and it, it, these minute little interactions as we go about our lives you would think would be replicated in social media but they're not we, in fact we it tends to be it tends to be largely um, in, incidental and uh, ephemeral you, you know pigeons reminding of one another that they are there so coming back to the thing about desire I mean we're increasingly atomized. We, you know, we are seeing declining rates of coupling in all continents on the planet, right? In some continents, absolutely to, to an alarming extent. And, and yet, you know, the, all of the sort of the, the, the initiatives that people come up with to try to, to try to change that in that there is this phenomenon called population implosion and, you know, populations will start to decline as a result of people not coupling and, and procreating is a serious threat. Vladimir Putin's statement that the biggest threat to Russia's future is declining population. So I wasn't entirely sure whether you were making a statement, a political statement about society in general. It's not simply about human beings switching these mechanisms off or you know, structures in our society imposing, imposing uh, these, these kinds of restrictions. Indeed, we're doing it to ourselves. You know? We're getting through a pandemic because of Netflix and, and daytime pornography, not because of, of uh, uh, not because of government, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, restrictions, which everybody is ignoring anyway, certainly in, our, in the society that I live in. So I, you know, as imagery, I, it, I thought that it was interesting, but I wasn't quite sure if I hadn't heard you guys speaking about it, whether I would have known um, where, you know, what, what that statement was, what, what it was that you were, what, you, you were talking about this, living with this duality of dystopia and utopia, but I wasn't sure which side of the fence you were coming down on, you know, or what about it you were, you, you were, you were wanting to say. I mean, that's all totally up to you to decide. I mean, is this a dystopian world or a utopian world? That's the conflict that we want to leave people with. Because, um, I mean, it's it's definitely, in a way, a political statement, um, social statement. And um, I don't I don't, dis I don't agree with you when um, stating that um, population decrease is a threat. Um, population decrease is actually not only... It, it happens majorly, at least from some part of the world, um, it happens when women get educated and they can study and they can work 
And I, I think there's a lot of problems in there that I can dive into, which I'm not going to do that because it's going to take a lot of time. But um, I think um, this idea of, um, I mean, in a way, it's just, it's, it's kind of um, leaving the viewer with their own personal, their own perception towards um, this futuristic society. Right. I mean, just, just to correct that, right? I wasn't making a statement about population decline. What I'm saying is that there are, there are forces. I, I'll use my favorite example that, you know, if you take every species on the planet, the male species has the ability to understand when the female of the species is ovulating, except for human beings. Yeah, lost. I didn't mean that. I'm sorry. So, that's what I'm talking about, you know, it, and it's the same thing with, with, with the phenomenon of, of us no longer, it's, no, it's no longer just marriage and fertility and a whole lot of sort of objective factors that you can point to and say, because of this, you've got population decline. In Sweden, you have people, you know, in, in, in Stockholm, you have 86% single occupancy housing. And for reasons that are just astonishingly difficult to understand when there are millions of incentives for people to people who live together. So that's a global phenomenon. And it's got a lot to do with, with um, it's got a lot to do with the, the brain chemistry. So I was fascinated by where you started with, but I don't know if you hadn't told us that at the, at the, before the movie, whether, um, whether we would have picked up on that. You know? Yeah, I think, um... I just wanted to chime in. I uh, think the the images and sort of the visuals you guys have both created are um, very striking and and beautiful in in um, many instances. But I think I want to agree on um, sort of the previous comments that the narrative is hard to follow. Like without the sort of presentation, you know, the concepts and ideas you're sort of talking about would not. Um, like don't come across right like to me your your project is more about sort of desire like an extreme form of desire that leads your protagonist to like a disillusionment in in terms of their self sense of self um like that to me is what i'm getting from your project and i'm, I'm sort of these ideas of dystopia utopia i'm i'm not seeing um, and I, I almost wish that that's where you focus and rather than trying to make like a much sort of broader sort of social political statement, like really looking at, um, you know, the body, beauty, desire, sort of how those things come together and how they affect like mental health or, or um, you know, sense of self, things like that. Oh, hang on. Marcus, hang on. You're muted. Oh, don't know how that happened. I think I did it. <laughs> okay. I, I completely agree um, that it would be a much more powerful and simpler story to follow if it was simply, you've got this amazing opening sequence, which is like beautiful fashion magazines, um, but protected with these clothes. And then you go on a, a, a visual journey and an aesthetic journey that kind of tells, that takes you on through an emotional sequence. But I didn't get that because it jumped around too much. And the, the emotion of the later sequences was just not so clear to me. I feel like I, alone, there's a lot of emotion. It's like a really strong project. I almost feel like your presentation of it is what takes away from from the narrative that you guys have created, maybe unintentionally. Um, you know, about sort of or, or sort of more emotive and like personal story. I I, I don't want to like harp on a point, but I think John's um, reference about the AA Bronson cover was so spot on and I think I think it's a, it's a good example because if you think about I, I put a link to Ulrike Rosenbach's work and like the first 
link is the Venus piece where the still from, which is used on the cover is from. And I think, you know, just, just using that as an example, um, you know, Venus, Botticelli's Venus is like loaded with references. You can think about the, you know, the male gaze and the female body. You can think about like all, all of these different things that are bound up with like, you know, uh, you know, women's sexuality, the projection of women, kind of the whiteness of women, you know, an idealization of the female body, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I think in that sense, like what's missing for me is the signification happening. So if, if you are interested, so even if it was like a question of like, you know, this kind of, you know, you're talking about utopia, dystopia. I don't, I think still, even with something that's even quite abstract as a conceptual framework, you still need to have some kind of, um, some kind of semiotic, like some kind of signification to that, that I would understand that, um, that I could bring that into this conversation. And so I, I kind of wonder about like, if you had, um, you know, no offense to Lauren, but like if you had used a projection of a different person, for example, right? Or, or a different kind of body or a kind of the source material of that image came from a different, you know, a different, from, from, a, from a particular kind of like a type of publication that then we might start to be able to associate certain kinds of more kind of, um, there'd be more kind of semantic layerings to the piece that we could then engage with a little bit more. And um, cause I think you you have the right pieces there in terms of like the, the ideas that you're met, you're talking about um, but it's somehow the, 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 the materiality of it or something needs to somehow like link to something in the world as such that we can then start to build on, you know, thinking about how all these associations start to develop, you know, quote unquote meaning, uh, in, in a way that is like, um, you know, and I understand you're saying sort of like, you know, it's up to us, but, but I think in terms of your authorship that, that. And, and the control that you have as creative people that that sort of that's the, the, the space where I feel like, you know, there could be some more deliberate um, decisions, but it could even be as simple as like, uh, well, you know, on the other for someone on the other pieces, like what happens when you swap out a different kind of music or a soundtrack, right? Like what happens when you it, it, immediately you start to develop different kinds of associations. And I think in, in that respect, maybe this could be an opportunity to sort of experiment a little bit more even with that, because there are some really successful moments in this uh, visually. Um, but as a, as a work, I'm, I'm really difficult. I'm having difficulty situating it. Like I'm like, is this about experimental filmmaking? Is it about, because it seems to be, alluding to certain things, but it doesn't really want to decide for me in terms of your intent, if, if it isn't, it is to kind of like allude to those references. So um, yeah, so anyways, but not to, not to harp on that, but I, I do think John's reference was really spot on. It's a really interesting discussion. Um, and I think that's what you were both hoping for. <laughs> Um, and I, I do agree. I think that what you've created as an aesthetic is very textured and um, unique, but the edit could be, we talked about this, it could be half of what you presented um, and then perhaps over the top of that, it would help the story come through. Um, but you, you've both worked really, really hard and you have worked with the projector and the camera in a way that you haven't before. So I think that um, I know I know both of you are very interested in the film industry and that this hopefully is kind of a little portal into there. So um, congratulations. Thank you. All right, the final group, Hannah and Alex. Hello. Um, my name is Hannah, my partner is Alex, and um, we will be presenting to you our film titled Omnos. And um, I'll let Alex talk about it for a moment and then we'll show you the film and then we'll go to some images that we wanna talk about. Yeah, I, I wanna say thank you for sticking through um, and to the last group, I really <laughs> appreciate that. Um, our, our film, it follows a character's journey with self-experimentation uh, and revolving a human enhancement through lack of resources, um, speculating about a future where one can predict and dramatic advances in genetic engineering and machine technology that can significantly enhance um, human physical and mental capabilities. Um, our characters construct a reality that they cannot necessarily be a part of. Um, and now we're going to show you our film.
Okay. Um, and then uh, I will I can show a PDF that showcases some of her imagery. Yeah. Um, we wanted to um, start by saying that when we first started this semester, um, we had no um, idea what this narrative would be at the end, but we wanted to sort of curate this atmosphere for um, this character to live in. And we did that through a series of experiments with um, textures and colors and lighting. And it, along the way, began to unfold this um, narrative that became the final video. Um, through some series of experiments, we realized sort of um, this visual language that we were creating and wanted it to be very specific to our character and the world she lives in. Yeah, um, and like it all kind of started with uh, a shed that's located in the back of Hannah's house <laughs> um, that we kind of used as our setting and um, we wanted that shed along with the nature scenes to be extensions um, off the character's life and what she's going through. Um, and as Hannah mentioned, we kind of curated the imagery and the experiments um, as an amalgamation of what the movie would feel like towards the end um, in terms of uh, colors and textures and uh, the visuals. Um, and then we were very interested in um, you know, in mental health and health, and like the healthcare crisis, um, and like what lengths some what D would go um, to kind of like achieve what's unattainable or what feels unattainable, and construct a reality that doesn't necessarily feel like their own. Um, and then, as to go into nature and as the story progresses, kind of like shed that skin, um, and. In, uh, re in realization of, um, you know, one's humanity in a way. Um, so we're gonna keep it kind of, we're gonna keep the discussion open now. Um, any comments? You know, the, um, the first sentence of Adolf loses ornament and crime is the human embryo in the womb passes through all the evolutionary stages of the animal kingdom. And I, I take it that your, your title amnos, does that relate to amniotic fluid? Um, yeah, that's actually interesting that you mentioned that. Um, we wanted to use the name amnos, which um, is a Greek word for um, like yeah. a lamb. Um, and we thought how we start this film is by her viewing something and wanting to follow it like, a, like almost the way that a lamb would to a shepherd. And she's sort of part of this like herd where she wants to um, be a part of. Oh, so did you say amnos is the Greek for lamb? Mm -hmm. It's a biblical, um, it's um, a biblical. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Because I, was, I thought it was a reference to the amniotic fluid in which, <laughs> which, you know, which is in the uterine sac and is in the, as I have just read on Wikipedia, I'm, <laughs> um, that, um, up to a certain point, um, before the sort of um, uh, uh, what are the keratinization of the skin, it's through the skin that um, the fetus receives all of its nutrients from its mother, passed through the amniotic fluid. And so, I the, the reason I mentioned that line by Adolf Lewis is this idea that actually you are kind of um, uh, recovering for us this kind of state of the human, which 
one doesn't ordinarily associate with the human, which is that its capacity to absorb nutrients and care and life and sustenance through the skin as a membrane. And I, I find that very, a very powerful gesture that you're kind of um, presenting this possible scenario in which one is able to reaccess this former state of one's being in which one was submerged in the amniotic fluid. And it's through that that one can kind of be restored to life or a new life or different life. Yeah. That's a very interesting comment, actually. <laughs> um, one of our kind of inspirations also for the, for the um, imagery was like embo like embalmment also, kind of like mm. I'm submerging, I mean, matter into liquid to preserve it in a way or do something for it. So, um, or revive it even. Mm -hmm. Or did you mention, maybe I missed this, did you mention sensory deprivation tanks at all as a reference? Uh, we did not. Mm -mm. I mean, that, that to me, have you ever been in one? They're pretty great. So, <laughs> but, but it relates to water because the, the inventor of that long story, long short, but is John C. Lilly, who was a, a scientist that did um, experiments with LSD um, and basically would like take LSD in order to communicate with dolphins as part of NASA's research. And it was super interesting actually is that his architecture of his lab was like, he immersed it in water. So his living room would literally fill with water in the labs to try to break down the kind of fourth wall of communication between, so dolphins could swim freely in his lab and then you'd be tripping on LSD and blah, blah, blah. Anyways, out of all that knowledge comes in that experimentation comes the sensory deprivation tank. and which is, you know, is a kind of tool now for, you know, kind of like biohacking. Uh, it's been kind of, you know, used now with like, you know, oxygen, ex extra oxygenated environments, et cetera, et cetera. Um, they're super interesting if you ever have the experience of being in one, like I, I, I do enjoy it, but it's, there's, I, I it felt like it was like the kind of obvious reference to this, but taken to the, it seems like you're taking it to the nth degree. Um, so if you haven't looked into it, I would highly advise you to do it um, because I think it is part of that kind of technology of the kind of biohacking of the better self in a way, uh, mm -hmm. you know, and, and, but it really calls into question a lot of problems with how we think about optimization, right? Because it's a, it's a project that is, um, it's a project that's like incredibly loaded um, ethically. Uh, there's lots of parameters around that, that I think, you know, deserve unpacking. Um, but I think there's something about this that, that definitely seems to be connecting into that. I, I think I would, um, yeah, I think I would agree with you in the, and I think our film does kind of touch on those same types of themes of that there is um, like in the case of sensory deprivation tanks um, and like who, who gets to go to these sensory deprivation tanks and benefit from them. And for um, the, that product or others, it's like they exist and whether or not they're accessible to people, like they will find a way. And if, and is that safe, you know, and is that, um, and is it worth it maybe? Yeah. I thought it was really beautiful. And I think that um, there were, I didn't totally buy the narrative um, that was presented at the beginning, but there were enough clues that I could put my own narrative on it without having to worry whether I'd got it right. Um, the one thing that threw me a bit was the kind of smoke thing. <laughs> but apart from that, I was with it all the way. I was like, okay, yeah, I get this. I get this. I got my reading of this. And um, I think also the, the music was really, really powerful really helped to um, drive the to drive the whole thing forwards and the, the the kind of yeah the kind of like the first one in a way the kind of visual links between different scenes that kind of hessian the browns that were in the interior and in the exterior that really freaky opening scene which is really surreal but sort of somehow works yeah. i think it was really really good I really i really enjoyed it and um yeah, it, like I said, there was a, there were enough clues for me to feel like I can build my own narrative on this and be confident that I've made a valid interpretation. 
it was just the right side of abstracts. Thank you. Yeah, I would agree. Um, I loved that first surreal image, and I did feel I did feel slightly cheated. There was no reference further on or ref, uh, return in some ways. I felt slightly cheated, but then I got so into it. I um, I was able to accommodate that kind of change, and I loved the fur. So you had the fur tank <laughs> in juxtaposition with the human skin so the fur tank contains the fluid and and um, doesn't absorb it but the human skin is absorbing it and I loved that as a kind of juxtaposition Anyone, any further thoughts? It's really great, the, the final edit that you've both done. The, this um, team, again, every week and right up until last week, we're experimenting, making new content. We, we went to the desert yesterday. We've just shot this again. So there was no lack of commitment or passion or producing. It was, um, there's so much more that didn't make this cut. So I really, I really commend you on being able to cut out what you, all the other stuff that you've made. And I think it's, um, I think it's a really successful film. So well done, really, really good. Thank you. So, thank you. So thank you everyone for joining us. Um, it's so wonderful to have you all here. Ariane, Clive, Natu, my dad's waving in the background, Marcus, Esther, John, Gregory, thank you for coming. Um, and Clive, sorry, I, I have a distorted, <laughs> distorted thumbnails. Um, and everyone else who had to leave early. Thank you for your time. Um, I hope we can do it again another time. And to the students, everyone has just gone above and beyond. Please stay on. We're going to have like a, a remote party somehow. Um, great work, everyone. Great job. Thanks so much for your time. Thank you all. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thanks. Congrats. Thanks. Thanks Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you. It's been great. Thank you. <laughs> I think everyone's gone apart from my mum and dad. <laughs> Woohoo! <laughs> you did it! Oh, my. Here we are. Put, your, put your mics on! <laughs> We're still on YouTube. Oh!